Well, good afternoon, everybody. I feel a little bit awkward here. I don't know whether there is any meaning of the speech of a politician after what you have heard in the morning session. Survivors, they shared their experiences with you before the tanks, under the jets. So compared to what they have gone through, I think we politicians are the last people to talk about the coup attempt in Turkey and its aftermath. However, I will try to share my observations about the political responses to the failed coup attempt in Turkey. So from a political perspective, we will try to understand what Turkey has gone through and what are the impacts of this tragic event on the 15th of July. Well, I would like to begin my talk by thanking the organizers for this uh, event to address such a um, selected audience. I feel a little bit nervous because I'm a politician, but I have a background in academia. I was a lecturer at this very faculty and at this very uh, university before becoming a, a politician. But what makes this symposium meaningful and significant today is its nature and also the commitments that people put in. This symposium is organized by a number of civil society organizations and hosted by the Marmara University, reflecting a working cooperation between the intellectual responsibility of the higher education institutions and free and civil spirit of activism of civil society organizations. As a politician, I participated in a number of meetings abroad to explain the threat that the failed coup attempt posed to democracy and democratic institutions in Turkey. I talked to politicians, government officials, met with people at think tanks and gave interviews to media to underline the fact that Turkey's commitment to democracy will prevail despite an unexpected and bloody coup attempt to hijack political power by overthrowing the elected president and the government. This time, I will address a different audience. Although I feel at home at the Marmara University and at the Faculty of Islamic Studies campus, where I worked as an academician before entering politics, I have to admit that I feel a little bit nervous because being a politician is intellectually consuming, I'm afraid. Since I became politicians, I almost forgot to read, research, and write. In my presentation, I will primarily focus on political responses to the pol failed coup attempt and its political consequences. I believe that the failed coup attempt provides a case study, not only for politicians. I believe that the failed coup attempt also provides lessons for everyone. Political scientists, lawyers, civil society organizations, especially scholars of religion, in my view, can look at this case very closely to analyze the messianic movements, the cults that abuse religion, public sphere, and citizenship for their own purposes and agendas. This is what has happened on the 15th of July when the Fethullah Gülen terrorist organization staged a coup in Turkey, which emerged in the 1970s. In the morning session, there was some debate on this issue, and I think in the afternoon panel you will have more um, revelations, let's say, on the nature of the Gulen movement in this country. Dear friends, it is not a dramatization to say that had the coup attempt on the 15th of July been successful, I wouldn't have been able to be here with you. I could have been killed. That has what happened to people. I could have been arrested, imprisoned, and tortured, or banned from politics. This is the best scenario, being banned from politics after the coup attempts or the coups in Turkey. Politicians faced all these terrible experiences after military coups in Turkey in the past. In fact, Turkish political history, which became a multi-party system in 1946 after a rule of one party since the establishment of Turkey in 1923, is marked by military interventions in political life. In 1960, the military overthrew the government. The junta arrested and tried prime minister and government ministers of that time. The prime minister, Adnan Menderes, 
Minister of Foreign Affairs, Fatin Rushdie Zorlu, and Minister of Finance, Hassan Polakan, were found guilty and sentenced to death by capital punishment. They were all hanged on September the 16th in 1961. The second military inter intervention took place on March the 12th, 1971, which forced the government to resign, plunging the country into a political and economic instability. The third military intervention took place on September 1980. I was young and remember what has happened on, on that uh, military intervention in Turkey. It has also overthrown the government, closed the parliament and all political parties. The courts at the time delivered hard, harsh sentences to politicians who were banned from politics for many years. An anti-democratic constitution was written, which is still largely valid that all political parties promised to change. So far, we have partly changed that constitution. Yet another military intervention took in different format where the armed forces did not directly overthrow the government but effectively used its power to mobilize the media, large parts of civil society, the media, the business world, the judiciary and the universities against the elected coalition government, which was forced to resign in 1997. This was called in Turkish, 28 Şubat süreci, 28th February process. Its impact is still felt uh, in the Turkish democratic um, uh, life. National Security Council at that time uh, made some recommendations and after that the coalition government uh, collapsed. There is no doubt that the military coups and interventions in political life left a lasting legacy on Turkish political history, which we still feel today. The country still mourns not only its human losses but also damages to its democratic institutions, economic losses, and political instability, and seeing the coups and interventions. When the AK Party came to power in 2002, after a political turmoil in the country, it has introduced sweeping democratization reforms, which curtailed the tutelary influence of the military, juristocracy, while empowering civil society, social and political groups at the periphery. As these reforms began strengthening democratic institutions, it is increasingly thought that there was hardly any reason to believe in the possibility of a military coup any longer. As the recent political history demonstrates, these were premature expectations on our side, at least as politicians. Other interventions in political life continued over the years. On 27th April 2007, the Turkish Armed Forces General Staff published an online memorandum on the eve of presidential elections in Turkey, which included warnings to the politicians and the government. The government at this time did not remain silent in the face of such a memorandum and strongly condemned the statement by the armed forces. However, the public prosecutor of the time opened a court case to close the AK party, claiming that this party and the government was undermining the, undermining the secular foundations of Turkey. Although the AK Party escaped being closed by a close margin by the Constitutional Court, this court was to close the ruling party almost at the time. So you can see that uh, uh, the judiciary was uh, very uh, ideological at the time. The public prosecutor acted on his ideological beliefs and tried to close the governing party which won elections uh, by a large margins at the time. What Turkish political life shows us clearly is the fact that there are different forms of interventions in politics to hijack the political power and overthrow the elected presidents and governments. Operations against the government and its several ministers on 17th and 25th of December 2003 are a case in point that retrospectively illustrates how the judiciary judges and prosecutors, the police forces and intelligence, and the state bureaucracy to a large extent can act at the order of an organization, namely the Fethullah Legulan terrorist organization to overthrow the government. So the story goes a little bit back in history. So on the 15th of July 2016, we have faced a uh, threat to our democracy, but it began much earlier. So there was an accumulation 
of power of the Gulenist movement in the state bureaucracy for a long time. It is beyond any doubt that Gulenists were behind operations by fabricating evidence, illegally listening and recording phone calls, offices and homes of people, and manipulating tapes which were posted to the internet to implicate the government ministers. And even President Erdogan's private home was listened and taped, wired by these uh, organizations. This case was an eye-opening event for the government which showed that Gulenists have infiltrated the state institutions and were well organized within different echelons of the bureaucracy, especially in judiciary, police forces, including, including the police intelligence unit, educational establishments. Over the years, the Gulen network was also able to establish hundreds of schools, courses, foundations, associations, newspapers, TV stations, and the business empire, including a bank, trying to legitimize what Gulenists have been doing. They were trying to present Gulen movement as a civic movement to domestic and the foreign audience for many years. Following the operations in 2013, all Gulen affiliated organizations have waged an open war on the government using their all powers and institutions, including of course their partners outside Turkey. And they are still doing that. The AK Party government has successfully averted first Gulen's attack in 2013. However, what was not clearly known, despite suspicions, that the Gulenists have been also infiltrating the armed forces since early 1980s. They were largely successful not to be identified because Fethullah Gulen ordered them to practice takiyya, which enabled Gulen-affiliated military students and ranked soldiers to hide their identities. The government, the ministries of justice and interior in particular, have launched several investigations about the Gulenists to find out when, how, and where, where they have infiltrated state institutions after 2013. The Gulenist cell within the armed forces remained silent during this process, and there was hardly any talk about the infiltration of Gulenists within the armed forces, and whether they had the capacity to initiate a coup. Gulenists did everything in the recent past to discredit the Turkish government, the AK Party, democracy and the rule of law, as well as causing malfunctioning of state institutions. Ibrahim Kalin explained in the morning session what they have done to discredit Erdogan, the AK Party government, and the uh, politicians in Turkey in the last, um, I think, five years, at least. For example, Gulen-affiliated judges, prosecutors, and the police arrested, jailed, tried, and imprisoned many people whose innocence was proved later. For example, you can look at those names maybe more closely later on. They arrested and jailed well-known journalists, Nedim Şener and Ahmet Şık, and former police chief Hanifi Avcı, on fabricated evidence for having critical views of the Gulen and Gulenists. Likewise, they arrested members of the armed forces, journalists, and intellectuals. I will give you a few names. Dursun Çiçek, Mustafa Balbay, Tuncay Özkan, İlhan Cihaner, who were later released. And now they are the parliamentarians on the benches of CHP, the main opposition party in Turkey. You can see that they have also tried to poison the political system in Turkey by using the state authority and the uh, instruments that they had. Now, I would like to move on to the political response to the military coup. Of course, the public response, the response of the citizen is seen by yourself here. They came here and they shared their stories. There was a direct and violent attack on democracy and democratic institutions, the constitution and the rule of law an elected government in Turkey on the 15th of July. A terrorist group within the Turkish Armed Forces initiated a coup to overthrow the government, close the parliament, and suspend the constitution. Those who were involved in the failed coup attempt bombed the parliament in Ankara, attacked the police headquarters and training centers. They also bombed national intelligence headquarters, blocked roads and bridges with tanks, occupied TV stations, they also wanted to capture and assassinate President Erdogan, who escaped death only by half an hour, and his family. And when they bombed the police uh, headquarters in Ankara, twin brothers lost their lives. 
two young men, they were policemen and they were being trained in Ankara, and they were from Adana. This is the city where I represent in the parliament. I visited their family, of course. I tried to talk to the father and the mother. They lost their ones, loved ones, but they told me one thing. For the sake of this country, for our independence, to, for the sur survival of democracy uh, and the Turkish nation, if I have other sons, I'll be ready to sacrifice them as well, just for this nation, just for the future of this country. Because the future of this country is not seen only the future of Turks or Kurds or whoever, whoever living in this country. The future of Turkey is seen also as a future of the Muslim, large Muslim world. This is the main, uh, I think, um, uh, idea that is very uh, uh, common among the Turkish people. The first and most effective political response to the failed military coup attempt came from President Erdogan. It's been explained here in more detail through a TV program, and he was able to call on Turkish people to take streets in order to defend the democracy and resist the coup plotters. Thousands of people poured onto the streets all over Turkey to defend democracy, and uh, today I was very pleased to hear that even before the call of Erdogan, people were mobilized anyway to take the streets in order to confront the coup plotters in this country. That shows that re really, the democratic culture had deeply rooted in this country. We had other uh, military interventions, as I have explained. They have overthrown the government, but there was no such resistance. This is a unique case in the Turkish political history, I think, which will never be uh, forgotten. And it will be an inspiration maybe for many other uh, nations and many other countries. The people themselves are the guardians of democracy in this country, as we have seen. Yes, as politicians, we made our efforts. We went to the you know, party headquarters. We went to our cities in order to mobilize the uh, people. But what we have seen that they were ready anyway. Even before the political intervention, uh, they showed their commitments to democratic life. And During the um, 15th of July night, the parliament speaker called on Turkish politicians or members of the parliament to come to the parliament that is in Ankara. People usually left Ankara by noon on, on Friday or just a day earlier. There were about 100 people, 100 members of the parliament in Ankara at the time. They went there. While they were having a meeting in the parliament, the building was bombed. It is available on, on TV, you can see. So they also escaped that by only maybe 20 meters or 30 meters. If the bomb had you know, uh, dropped on a different place, they would have all died. You can see that the politicians, in the face of such an attack on the democratic institutions, were there. The prime minister, he was also on television encouraging people and calling on people to uphold democracy in Turkey and resist the uh, plotters. Now, I just would like to appeal to your imagination. Can you imagine that your own jets and helicopters bomb your parliament? Can you imagine that your tanks block roads, bridges, and attack your own citizens? This is exactly and literally what had happened in Turkey on the 15th of July. However, as already po pointed out, there was a uh, concerted effort by the President Erdogan, Prime Minister, the government ministers, as well as all other political parties, we also need to acknowledge that all political parties uh, were against uh, the, the uh, plot. And the media, which was very critical of the government for many years, this time they also realized that the threat was against Turkey and the uh, democratic institutions. And of course, more than any other factors or actors in Turkey, the people were the guardians of democracy as we have uh, already seen. Now, if you have been following Turkish politics, you will be well aware of the fact that there is hardly any consensus on political issues in Turkey, almost none. I have been in active politics for the last one and a half years almost, and in the parliament, we have no agreement on any, other, any, on any subject in Turkey, on the Kurdish issue, on democratization, on the constitution, on economic issues. All political parties have different views. 
But for the first time in recent history, we have a consensus. This is an exception, but already the, there is a consensus uh, well established. Across the political divide, everybody believes that the, the Gulenist people or the Gulenist organization or the Fatullah Gulen terrorist organization is the mastermind behind this uh, failed coup. Average people on the street also believe that Gulenists has been infiltrating into the state institutions for many years under the quise of a spiritual movement. So this is something that should be discussed here in maybe more detail. The nature of the Gulen movement, whether this is a spiritual movement, whether this is a movement of dialogue, whether it's a peaceful movement, whether it is a, some kind of a social organization which is investing in philanthropy. I think this is something that should be questioned more and more. Um, probably in the panel uh, we will hear more on this uh, subject. Fethullah Gülen presents his movement as a spiritual and civic movement. It is clear that over the years they have established, as we have explained, a wide educational network, including 16 universities in Turkey, the bank, the media empire, etc., etc. And there is a reason behind it. One reason is to recruit people for their organizations. They usually recruit the best and the bright from the students. And also, as I said, they have accumulated a lot of money, uh, financial resources, and the media in order to propagate their own views. Well, on the 15th of July and afterwards, we and the people of Turkey who stood for democracy, who lost their loved ones, believe that these murderers must be brought to justice. As I say, now there are a lot of discussions and debates in the Western media and in the Western circles, in the European Union, in the Council of Europe, they are saying that the measures that Turkey is taking is harsh. But as you have seen, that many people have gone through difficult times. They were injured, they lost their loved ones, many people were murdered. And now, what are the expectations of people from us as politicians? They would like to see justice in Turkey. Therefore, what we have done as politicians in Turkey, as the governing party, we have declared state of emergency. And many people say, well, state of emergency is not democratic. It is a constitutional right in every country when you face such an existential threat, you take strong measures. Therefore, Turkey has taken such me measures. The purpose is very clear, bringing the perpetrators to justice, Secondly, consolidating and protecting democracy while eliminating any further threats to the democratic institutions and the rule of law in Turkey. And Turkey is a member of the Council of Europe, one of the founding members of the Council of Europe, actually. Now, Turkey, according to uh, Article 15 of the European Court of Human Rights, is uh, qualified to uh, declare state of emergency. The France has done the same thing when they had uh, terrorist uh, uh, attacks in their own country. This is what we have been doing uh, in Turkey. The government also issued several decrees to address the risks and threats in the state system posed by Gulenists. Fethullah Gulen affiliated civil servants were civil servants were either suspended or dismissed from their positions. Schools, associations, financial institutions, universities labor unions, media organizations closed the link with the Gulenist terrorist organizations were closed down. You can see when I start counting what kind of institutions, instruments, and capabilities they have, you will be surprised. But as I said, they have presented themselves in a different, uh, different format. I should say that at this uh, moment, we are well aware that there are some concerns and ex these concerns are expressed uh, by many people about the number of people who were suspended from their duties or their job contracts ended. In this context, I underline that the government takes every effort to uphold the rule of law and it will continue to do so. At the moment, both all political parties, as well as the governing AK party, and the government itself and all ministries have established commissions. If people feel that they are treated unjustly, they can come, they can apply, and they can get their rights back. Of course, as I say, Turkey has been facing enormous challenges 
I think no other country in the world uh, faces such security threats and existential uh, risks, such as Daesh, the PKK, now uh, Fatullah Gulen terrorist organization, the flow of uh, uh, refugees and migrants around, and two, let's say, failed states near our border, that is Iraq and Syria. And in the face of such threats, of course, I think the, the state and the politicians are expected to take uh, strong uh, measures. Now, in conclusion, I will say only one thing to those who think that the post-coup developments are a cause of concern for the future of democracy in Turkey. This is a black propaganda. There is no need to worry about the future of democracy and the rule of law in Turkey as proved on the night of the 15th of July. We have seen by experience that the garden of democracy is the people itself. Yes, of course, the media, the parliamentarians, civil society, associations, uh, political parties as legal institutions play an important part in the preservation of democracy but as in the case of Turkey, in contrast to previous uh, coups, we have seen that the people themselves are the formidable guardians of democracy and the rule of law in Turkey. I will end up by a warning to our esteemed guests here. The Fatullah Gülen organization is active in all your countries. They have established schools, associations, maybe foundations, etc., And they are recruiting your bright people to their organizations. This is a huge risk for the future of your country, for the future of your political life. Let me give you one example how they can poison the political life in a country other than Turkey. In Britain, we have a lot of, I think, friends, brothers, sisters coming from UK. Fatullah Gülen affiliated organization in Turkey paid a British MP to write a report on human rights issues in Turkey. Of course, the report is very critical because he is paid by a Gulenist foundation based in Turkey. You can see how far they can reach out. Therefore, I urge you to warn your own governments, to put pressure on them to stop operations and activities of this terrorist organization. As I say, of course, when, when it comes to politicians, we do that. We talk to status persons, we talk to politicians in your countries. But since you come from a uh, rooted organization with, with social and political influence in the countries, we urge you, of course, to keep this relation continue, but also to put pressure on the governments and official uh, people in countries where you live that this is an organization uh, which is different than how we have seen or we have uh, uh, evaluated so far. Uh, I will end up here, and once more I'd like to thank the organizers and all of you who came from different countries, and I think we need you in our uh, fight against this uh, terrorist organization, and if we can stand together, uh, so we will be the winner. Thank you.